Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever been chased by a bee? We all do the same thing when that happens, right? I don't know where it is. We're scared of it. <laughs> Every time. We spend a huge portion of our lives trying to prevent ourselves from looking like idiots. That's what we do. Think about it. A lot of time. But when it comes to the bee, all of that goes right out the window. We don't even care anymore. It's kind of like when you walk through a spider web. Same thing. Instantly, instinctively, we become karate masters, right? The spider web. Last week, we talked about fears, things we're scared of. We looked at fear of the Lord. We saw that that's a good thing to be afraid of that. What about fear of your parents. When you were a kid, did you ever reach a point where you got a little too comfortable around your mom or your dad? You ever have that happen? Perhaps you said a bad word in front of your parents. Maybe that happened to you. For me, one of my first times was when I got chased by a dog. My dad and I were walking along, and a dog literally got off the chain, and I perceived that it was coming after me, probably wasn't, and I started running and swearing. (laughs) And of course, the dog chased me more, right? Doesn't help. Don't do that. They think you're playing or something like that. Christmas time. It's coming. It's really weird here in Southwest Florida, isn't it? It doesn't feel like Christmas. It's kind of strange, except at night when you drive by all the nice neighborhoods with the palm trees. But during the day, it's like, really? It's going to be Christmas in a few days this week. So, makes me think of a Christmas story that's on the TV constantly. So, you've probably seen it come on the television 5,000 times a day. They should get their own channel for that show. You probably remember Ralphie and his dad. He gets a flat tire. So, he wants to be like a pit crew mechanic or something. He's like, time me! I'm gonna go change the tire. He gets excited about it. Who does that? Ralphie wants to help. So Ralphie gets out of the car too, and he's holding the hubcap with all the nuts. And his dad, I think he hit it with a tire iron, and they all go flying out. And Ralphie says, fudge. But he clears it up for us. He says, that's not what I said. I said the mother of all bad words. Mom interrogates him with the soap in the mouth. Some of you are old enough to remember that. When that was a possibility, we could do that. 
interrogates him. Where did you learn this? All right. But if you watch the movie carefully and you know in your own life, we probably learned it from our parents. Today, we find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 12, where we will see that Jesus is the ultimate example as the Son, and God is our superior Father. First, as it pertains to the Son, we'll pick up where we left off last week and add a couple of verses. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Jesus gave us the ultimate example to follow on receiving discipline, being disciplined, maybe not complaining. We saw the agony in the garden. Yes, he asked the Father, if it's possible, take this cup. I don't really want to get crucified, but your will be done, not mine. Jesus had fears, we saw last week, but ultimately he was obedient to the Father. And so, we must follow Jesus' example in obedience and both exhibit and receive discipline. Hebrews 12, 5, we'll continue. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So just as Jesus is the superior son and our superior brother, as we've seen, God is the superior Father. Last week, we talked about kind of a bad word, right? Fear. In this series, we're talking about things like that. Obedience. Maybe they're not really bad words, but we definitely don't like them. One of them is discipline. I don't like that too much. In Hebrews, we've seen the relationship between the Father and the Son. So I want to connect last week's idea by starting in the Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 7. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. My child, listen when your father corrects you. Don't neglect your mother's instruction. I'm going to hit the pause button, stop the tour bus for a second, and point something out. A little disclaimer here. There's a difference between discipline and abuse when it comes to parenting. We need to know what that is. We can do it physically. We can do it with our words. We can manipulate and do things like that. So many people, it's kind of like the husbands and wives thing, right? So if a husband wants to be a little manipulative, they're going to take some scriptures. They're going to use that and then not read the rest that applies to them, right? But there's a standard for all of us, especially if we're supposed to be leading well. And so you'll get a lot of parents who will say, honor your mother and father, that. 
So pick one of the Ten Commandments. They like that one a lot. Right? But maybe they don't like a few of the other ones. So what happens? Uh, we don't have to honor people in their sin. We don't have to honor sin to do that. And if we're going to go Old Testament, right, you want to do the, okay, let's pick the Old Testament Scriptures. We can do that. But let's look at some of the other commands. Like, for example, if someone commits murder or adultery or something like that, we get to stone them to death. <laughs> so what would happen back then to a parent who is doing one of those sins and then said, honor me? <laughs> sure, I can honor you by stoning you to death. <laughs> get it? So there's the other side to this coin that we have to look at, right? You have to kind of earn that respect, so to speak. We need to look at both sides of the coin here. That's what we're going to do today. We're not going to look just at one side of it, both. For example, Paul in Ephesians, he is quoting Old Testament Scripture. He says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Quote, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth because they won't kill you. But keep reading. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Both sides of the coin. We need to look at them. We all, we all have responsibilities in the family unit. And if we neglect them, we will lose some of our privileges. The older generation often accuses the younger generation of being entitled. You heard that? Entitlement. It's the younger generation. They're entitled. But we'll see today that perhaps, perhaps the older generation is often suffering from entitlement syndrome as well. We must always love and honor one another, but it can have some boundaries if need be. Then we have the other side of things. So if we have strict discipline over here, we have what I like to call prosperity parenting over here. We talked about prosperity preaching. Well, there's also prosperity parenting, so to speak, like the prosperity gospel. Some Christians and kids feel entitled to just get whatever they want, no matter how they're behaving. I'm a child of God, so I can get whatever I want right? Wrong. It doesn't work that way. What would happen if we just let kids do whatever they wanted, right? Get whatever they want. Actually, I think a lot of people do. And how is that working out for us today? Modern parenting seems almost void of discipline. I don't know about you, but when it came to having discipline and being disciplined, my parents did not play any games at all. I knew they were in charge. For example, <laughs> you did not, did not, just any old time of the day, open up the refrigerator. You didn't do that. They're showing there. What are you doing? <laughs> You're wasting electricity. You're going to ruin your appetite. We get yelled at for that. You didn't snack during the day. You had to earn snack. By doing what? Eating your dinner. And if you didn't finish your dinner, what happened? It became breakfast. That's what happened. Strict. But I'd say it worked. You did not get whatever you wanted. Didn't happen that way. You were not entitled to anything. You had to earn it. And if you got out of line, you knew it wasn't yours anymore. 
Never was. I remember one time I was really bad. <laughs> a lot. But <laughs> this one time really struck me. I was in a Star Wars. I had all the Star Wars toys and I had a paper route, so I earned a lot of it, but my dad did give me a lot of stuff. And I had Star Wars bed sheets and curtains and t-shirts and underoos and all kinds of cool stuff. Remember underoos? You could run around in your underwear. It was awesome. Well, anyway, <clears throat> I was really bad. Came home from school one day, and my room was emptied. Just white sheets, regular curtains, gone. <laughs> now, Sometimes I'd get physically disciplined, but that kind of discipline worked too. I remembered. Now, I want to do another disclaimer here. In my case, and many others listening, sometimes the physical discipline was a bit much. Again, I'm not advocating for any kind of physical abuse here. But if I'm being honest, sometimes it worked. Help me remember. I didn't forget. But today, it seems that you have prosperity parenting where the kids just do and get whatever they want, no matter what. Where no doesn't mean no anymore. Or in fact, you can't say it anymore, right? It's too negative. Right? You might hurt their confidence if you say no, right? As people say, make another choice. What? There is no other choice. No. <laughs> Sit quietly. Obey. No, that's too negative. But we'll see today, the Bible doesn't say to do it that way at all. The Bible says no or don't <laughs> a lot. So these people, these prosperity parents, what they're really saying is they know better than the Bible. Mm -hmm. I can parent better than God. Interesting attitude. And some of these people are actually calling themselves Christians. Kind of funny. But how is that working today? How is that working for this next generation? Lack of discipline breeds lack of discipline. So modern Christianity, as we've seen in this series, is a lot like modern parenting. Yeah, it's supposed to be about a relationship, but a balanced one. Both sides of the coin. Both the blessings and the discipline. So let's look at biblical parenting. So what we're going to do, <laughs> I'm going to read you a really difficult quote. Really difficult, but... We're going to take a look at it through a biblical lens, not what we think or what we want to think or what society tells us to think, just a biblical lens. So this quote is from a biblical preaching illustration book for pastors, for sermon prep. And it's been used a lot over the last probably 40 years. So the book's by Michael P. Green. I don't know if he made it up or whether he was borrowing it from somewhere. So here we go. Every baby starts life like a little savage, completely egotistic and self-centered. Babies want what they want when they want it, be it a bottle, mother's attention, or a dry diaper. Deny a baby these wants, and he or she is seized with rage. Babies have no morals, no knowledge, and no skill for survival. All children, not just certain children, are potential delinquents. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of their infancy, where they gave free reign to every impulse and had every want instantly gratified, all children would grow up in that mold of depravity. That is the stuff out of which are made criminals, killers, and rapists. Tough quote. There's what we want to think about that. What society tells us about that? Then there's what the Bible says about it, if we're reading it right. So let's look at what the scriptures say about disciplining our children. We saw what Hebrews says right out the gate this morning. 
Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Before that, the word punish was used, if you were looking very carefully. And in the Greek, it is scourge, scourge. Same Greek word used for when they flogged Jesus before the cross. Sounds pretty harsh. Proverbs 13, 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Absorb that. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. So, the Bible does prescribe physical discipline. And again, if I'm being honest, there were times when that was applied to me as a child, and it worked. I didn't forget the lesson. But discipline doesn't have to be physical discipline. We can do a lot with our words. So I want to connect some dots for you this morning. <clears throat> Talk about Adonijah. So how do we get there? Proverbs, most of them are written by Solomon. Right? A couple at the end, not so much. Lemuel's mom, Hezekiah, but most are written by Solomon. Solomon, if you're new, King David's son, but not his only son. See, in the beginning, he had a lot of trouble <laughs> with Absalom. It doesn't go well there. Next in line will be Adonijah. Solomon, though, is younger. And so naturally, you would think that Adonijah is going to become the next king when David dies. But that's not the case because the Lord tells him that's going to be your heir, Solomon, and he's going to build the temple. Well, David gets old. And so He's having trouble keeping warm. So they get him a, kind of like a servant girl, almost like a concubinish type of thing, Abishag. That'll be important a little later. <laughs> Doesn't seem important, but it is. In the meantime, Adonijah proclaims himself the king. And it's a big deal because he gets the support of Joab, his military commander, Abiathar, one of the priests Jesus will mention later in the New Testament. Uh-oh. Well, the prophet... Nathan gets Bathsheba. That's Solomon's mom. So they have different moms, these sons of David. He says, yo, go remind David that Solomon's the king. She does so, and David proclaims Solomon the king. Yay! They celebrate. But not Adonijah. Now he's worried. Really freaks out, thinks Solomon's going to kill him. But Solomon has mercy and lets him live. Okay. David dies. And then Adonijah goes to Bathsheba and says, hey, can you convince Solomon to give me Abishag? So it's kind of like taking his dad's wife in a way. I'll ask Solomon. <laughs> Solomon isn't having it. He said, that's it. That is it. You might as well make this guy king. I'm going to kill him. And so he kills or has Adonijah killed. So why... Did he die? What got Adonijah killed? Well, let's back up towards the beginning of the story. Here's the reason why. 1 Kings 1.5. About that time, David's son, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with chariots and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time. Even asking, why are you doing that? David never disciplined him. And he got him killed. Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you, you will ruin their lives. You see, discipline doesn't have to be physical. According to the Bible, it is sometimes. We see that. But discipline also means we tell them the truth in love. It means we don't spoil them. It means we don't let them believe that we're entitled to anything. Adonijah 
suffered from entitlement syndrome because his dad let him do it. And according to words, if you're doing it right, you really shouldn't need too much physical discipline. The Bible talks a lot about the power of words everywhere, from the Proverbs to James chapter 3. But it also tells us we have to be wise and careful about the way we use them. Then there's the other side of the coin. Children, Proverbs 12.1, to learn you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Proverbs 13.1, a wise child accepts the parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. A wise child listens and learns from our words when, back to the other side of the coin, used rightly. Proverbs 15.5, only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Whoever learns from correction is wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. So why is it worth obeying? Why is it worth listening? You will grow in understanding. And because of that, save yourself from some trouble. And in our faith, why? Well, because we're being led by a good father who loves us and cares about us and provides us with a good example, which brings us to another side of things here. Yeah, you can employ physical discipline. Yeah, you can use words. But there's one thing that I think is even more powerful. Our example. Have you ever heard the phrase, do as I say, not as I do? Mm. That kind of thinking is actually what leads to a lot of misunderstandings in the Bible. We've seen that. You should be looking at what Jesus did, not just what he said. Otherwise, we might end up ripping our eyes out, right? Here's a phrase I like a little better. Actions speak louder than words. Proverbs 17.27, a truly wise person uses few words. And so I'm going to end my sermon right now. A person with understanding is even-tempered. So we can use words to instruct and discipline, but the Bible also talks a lot about using fewer words and leading by example. So I'm try to take you to something that we went over recently. We were in a Corinthian series last year-ish, and so those of you who have been with us for a while, take you back there, refresh your memory a little bit. Corinth was kind of messed up. So when we look at that book of the Bible, it's a New Testament letter written by Paul, the apostle, along with Sosthenes, to the church in Corinth, where they're experiencing a lot of messed up stuff. The first issue is what I like to call pastor worship. This is why we talked about it in this series, right? We talked about celebrity pastors propping people up. A problem in the early church. And in Corinth, they're guilty of it. Oh, no, Apollos is a better speaker. I'll come to church service when he's speaking, right? No, Peter's better. I follow Paul. Paul gets really angry. <laughs> the first four chapters are divided to, or dedicated to that issue. Division is what I mean to say. Division in the church over these factions being developed. And Paul says some interesting things if you're paying attention. First of all, he says... I'm like a father to you. Follow my example. Do you want me to come with a rod <laughs> or with love? Imagine me saying that to the church. <laughs> Imagine that. Todd, what do you want? <laughs> you going to cut it out? Different in the early church, wasn't it? I wasn't afraid to say things like that. Then later, he says again, my example, chapter 9, ends with, I discipline my body so that when I preach, I'm not disqualified. Interesting. You see, the best way to exert discipline is to 
exhibit discipline. Paul knew that. You see, if you were leading troops up a hill in battle, and you charge up the hill to take it, you look behind you and there's no one there. You're not leading anyone. If no one is following you, you're not leading. We must be a good example. We must be leading well with love. That's the real key. Whether it be as fathers, husbands, if your children, your wives, your spouses know that you love them and you're leading well with goodness, they'll likely follow you if you're doing it right. You see, you have to be worthy of following. If you want your wife to do that first Peter thing and submit to you, <laughs> right? You have to what, does it say? Treat her as your own body. You have to love her. She has to know that. And she won't have a problem with it. The other side of the coin. We need to do our part if we're fathers, husbands, first. We need to do that well. That's what's important. If we look at our children, we look at our wives, look at our spouses, moms, dads, we both have to play our part. And if we're leading well, eh, probably going to follow. But if they're not following, we have to look back at ourselves. We have to do some self-inventory, take some self-reflection. Because kids, I found it very funny, early on, it's kind of like looking in a mirror, if we're being honest. It's tough. Now, only if we really can say with complete honesty and integrity that we are leading well with love, that we are disciplined ourselves in all ways, then and only then can we say it's on them in that case. What happens, if I'm being honest? It happens. Or someone just wants to be that way. It doesn't matter. They might say something like, oh, that's too difficult. I want to go through all that work. All right, and then make excuses for why they're not doing it. That's well, too much. It's intimidating. Whatever. But you'll see this example come up. Paul used it in Acts chapter 20-ish, Ezekiel. He's told this by the Lord, Ezekiel 3, I believe, chapter 33, 2. He likens him to a watchman on a tower. He says, you're like a guard on a tower. Right? So if you see the enemy coming and you warn the people, they don't do anything about it, well, the blood's on their hands then. If you warn them, they do something about it, well, the blood's not on your hands. So that's kind of how it is. And this is how it is with God. He's worth following. He's worth submitting to. He's worth obeying. He loves us. So if you don't know that, John 3.16 gave his only begotten son. That's how much he loves you. So he's worth listening to. Jesus was the ultimate example of the ultimate love all the way to the cross. So if we're not listening, if we're not obeying, it's always on us. He made the ultimate sacrifice with the ultimate example. He's not asking us to do anything he wouldn't do himself. I want to invite you all this week, Thursday? Is that Christmas Eve? Wow! Thursday, Christmas Eve, 6.30. We are having our Christmas Eve service right here. And I want to invite you, if you're tuning in from somewhere else, you can tune in. We're going to be filming it, streaming it. We're going to talk about the ultimate gift of the Son. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our dear Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you for all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. 
All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.